I'm Quentin Compton. I'm Quentin Compton Bishop. I'm the chair of the Levantine Heritage Foundation. Um, as we have a few um, new faces with us this evening, I'm going to give just a, a very brief introduction to who we are and what we do. So the Levantine Heritage Foundation was set up in 2010. Um, its purpose is to uh, preserve, record, um, and share the sort of uh, memories, heritage, culture, uh, a whole diversity of things about um, the Levantine communities of the Eastern Mediterranean. And you know, it all started with uh, Craig Enser's website, um, where he had already collected uh, a huge amount of information, testimonials from uh, Levantine descendants, such as myself. And it, the trigger for setting up the foundation was um, a conference mm -hmm. organized in Izmir in 2010, uh, where we uh, were sort of collaborators with the organizers, including the Izmir Chamber of Commerce, in bringing together uh, families um, and academics um, in a complementary uh, event where you know, families are sort of researching their Levantine uh, history and academics um, who are studying you know, various aspects of the age of anything going back to you know, the, the 15th century were able to provide context for many of the uh, independent family researchers. So since then, we've organized um, quite a number of events. Uh, Craig will know the number, but it's probably in excess of 35 or 40, including international conferences, um, two to three day events uh, in Istanbul um, and uh, in London and in Athens. But in recent years, we've started these Zoom talks on a regular basis um, where we present an aspect of Levantine heritage. Um, Thank you. Uh, so we are a. Uh, well, we'll start from the beginning. So we are a membership um, uh, organization. Was supported by uh, friends and uh, members and sponsors to a limited extent, um, and our aim is to continue to develop the material on our website and to have these events for our community around the world. And it's fair to say that we are probably the biggest, uh, you know, most authoritative. We have the biggest collection of records on things Levantine. And, you know, we get approaches uh, several a week for people looking for images, um, introductions to uh, others who may be able to help with research, be it academic or, or independent family type research. So uh, you know, if, you're, if you're interested in um, seeing what we do, do have a look at the website. If you'd like to uh, support us, please get in touch uh, with me. Um, the email will be on the website. Um, just before we uh, move to uh, this evening's event, I'd just like to highlight a few events um, that are coming up. Next week on the 28th of March, we have a hybrid event. So this is an event where those who are in London can uh, join us at the Royal Asiatic Society um, near Euston Station um, for an event, uh, a talk by uh, Gemma Masson on upstairs, downstairs British diplomatic travellers in 18th century Istanbul. And this takes a very broad view of what uh, the art and, and activity of diplomacy uh, was in the sort of 18th and early 19th, uh, and early 20th, 18th, 19th, early 20th centuries, um, you know, that it was not just those who had the title of diplomat or consul or ambassador, but also their families, their associates who played a role in uh, recording and interacting 
with uh, the, the various people and communities where they were based. Um, so that is actually at the slightly later time of uh, eight, uh, 630 GMT. It's a hybrid event. So those that would like to attend in person, please uh, register. Uh, and those that, and also if you would like to attend via Zoom, um, uh, Craig, I think the link will be available as usual shortly before the event, but please do register on the website. The flyer is on the, is on the website, on the homepage. Further ahead, um, and not yet available for booking, but just really dates for you to hold in your diaries, on the 22nd of September, um, there will be a conference, uh, one day conference in Istanbul, um, organized uh, with the help of the French consulate. It will be held at the Palais de France in Istanbul. Um, and it is being organized by our uh, associate uh, partners in uh, Istanbul, um, the Levantine, uh, the LKMD. Uh, it, it's a Turkish name, and I can't. I wouldn't want to embarrass myself too much by by trying to say say it. So, twenty second of September, Istanbul, for those that uh, can get there, um, and then further out again on the seventeenth and eighteenth of November, we are planning our first event uh, in Beirut uh, in collaboration with the Sosok Museum and uh, it will be held in the Sosok uh, Palace. Um, this will focus um, mainly on um, how collecting archives, how to preserve, collect, um, and uh, record and digitize archives, family archives. And the Sosok uh, family uh, are effectively sponsoring this. They have a big archive themselves. Um, and they are setting up a, an archive center. So we are there to help promote the event and to support the launch of their uh, archive center, 17th and 18th of November. And in association with uh, that, there will be tours um, to CIDA and uh, around Beirut. Now that's of course subject to you know, things uh, being uh, stable, um, but uh, you know, we're, we're pressing ahead with plans for that event. So that, that's enough from me, um, and, and so too this evening. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Uri Kufferschmidt uh, from the University of Haifa. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, Uri's background, um, he's Professor Emeritus at the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at uh, Haifa University. Uh, got quite a diverse background, born in Montreux uh, in Switzerland, grew up in the Netherlands, studied in Leiden, London and Jerusalem. Uh, he's taught social history of the Middle East. And he also served as a correspondent of Dutch and Belgian uh, radio corporations. Um, He's uh, published uh, you know, quite a number of things, and uh, there are sort of three books um, to mention. Um, the book, uh, Henry Naus Bay, Retrieving the Biography of a Belgian Industrialist in Egypt. Um, uh, another, the Oros de Bach Saga, um, European Department Stores and Middle East Consumers. So we'll, we'll hear uh, quite a lot of material from that book. And, a book in the works, The Diffusion of Small Western Technologies in the Middle East about invention, use, and need in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so what we'll do is I'm going to give way to uh, Uri, um, and then we will have uh, our questions, um, and comments afterwards, um, which I will chair. If you wish to ask a question, make a comment, please raise your hand or raise a Zoom hand or wave or put a question in the chat. There was a question from um, 
Liz, um, on the sound quality. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Wave if you can. Okay, good. All right, so if it's not me, then I'm going to hand over now to Uri. Uh, thank you so much for preparing your presentation. We look forward to hearing it now. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, honorable invitation and for the introduction. Let me begin to say that I'm not in any way descending from a Levantine community, but as a social and cultural historian of the modern Middle East, there's a lot which connects me to your heritage. And after all, Haifa, from where I speak now, belongs to the same orbit. My field of research and teaching is social and cultural history, a field which has over the last few years uh, all the time offered new challenges. I found that there was more to the history of imperialism, the military power, conquests and exploitation, more than railways, steam navigation, electricity grids, vent irrigation systems and the like, which I all call big technologies. This is how I started investigated small technologies, objects manufactured in Europe or America, and indeed innovative manufacturers, products of the same era. People, or rather certain upper layers of the population would acquire them by their own agency, that is by their own will, if they desire, desire to have them, and if they could afford them. Most private people, of course, could not purchase a high railway or an electricity plant, but many, not all, could afford Western commodities. Some would say that this is a form of softer Western imperialism. But anyway, from the 1980s in general historical studies and for the studies of the Middle East from around 2000, a new field of systematical research emerged, namely the system, the study of consumerism say consumer culture, which somehow shifted our interest from industrial production to the significance of uh, social uses, gender, taste, fashion, food and clothing habits, households, urban space and the like. It corresponded, it's corresponded with the steep rise of the press and of commercial advertising, as well as the impact of globalization and modernization. I began tackling the regional spread of newly invented consumer goods, each as a sort of biography, a sort of material history, in a context of time and place, the social life of things, to speak with the Indian American anthropologist Arjun Apadurai. Things, objects, telling a story of their marketing, their spread, their acquisition, and trickling down from elites to upper middle classes and then to lower classes. Which of these became must have objects and proved to be beneficial, beneficial at least to certain segments of the society and which of them failed? I reached the conclusion that not all of these were accepted in the same way or at the same pace. And I started with sewing machines, went on with typewriters, reading glasses, photographic cameras, automobiles, etc each with their own differential narrative in the countries of the Middle East. In fact, this is the focus of my new book, Soon to Appear, which is somehow connected to the topic of tonight's presentation. For instance, sewing machines in the Middle East were a great success. Typewriters were considerably delayed till the coming of word processors. Automobiles needed infrastructures first and pianos, remain stuck in the upper echelons of society. But today, the main topic of this presentation concerns the chain of Varosti Buck department stores in the Middle East and North Africa, roughly speaking between the mid 19th and the mid 20th centuries. My interest in Varosti Buck developed unexpectedly, starting in 2004 from sewing machines in the Middle East. A singer in particular, starting around 
1855 in the United States began to sell to households in the Middle East only from the early 1880s, when a few million had already been sold in the world. This is how I come I came to Rostibak. I found that that particular trading firm for some time and at certain places held depots of Singer machines before Singer itself established its distribution network in the region. By the way, most of which were exported to the Middle East uh, were not manufactured in the States, but by, by the huge Singer factory at Clydebank, Glasgow. I had seen the name of Rosti Bak in some Egyptian and Ottoman magazines, and the name intrigued me. But at the same time, uh, there was hardly anything systematically accessible, and the internet was still in its infancy. I even placed an advertisement in a French newspaper for information and got two reactions, uh, no more than that, but it was a beginning. This is much easier today. There's a lot of information on Orosti back on the, on the web, including on the website of your foundation. With patience and the research in many libraries and archives, I was able to reconstruct at least a basic history of the enterprise. A book which I called Orosti Bak, the Orosti Bak Saga, a, due to the longevity of the firm's trade history, and an article specifically on its activities in Egypt, which more or less asked the question, who needed such a foreign form of commerce in the Middle East? Both appeared in 2007, and I see with satisfaction that my work is used, though not always attributed. So first of all, something about the families, both which were both of Central European Jewish background and who came in the course of time twice intermarried. Adolf Orosdi, Hungarian for Schnabel, meaning a bird's beak, the founding father of the firm, um, had been an officer in the army of Lajos Kossuth, the leader of the Hungarian revolt of 1848. After their defeat, a few thousand comrades had found refuge in Aleppo. It still intrigues me how out of Orosdi uh, there even wrote a Hungarian Turkish dictionary for Kossuth, today kept in the National Library in Budapest. It points to great abilities, or maybe even to some earlier acquaintance with the Ottoman Empire. We don't know. We know also little about his stay in Aleppo, but very recently I found a friendly connection with the Austrian Posh family there, who had been traders in crystal goods from Bohemia. Adolf's first son, Leon, was born in Aleppo in 1855, but his second son, Philippe, in 1863, which means uh, in Istanbul, which means that they already had moved there. Adolf had set up a ready to wear clothing business in the Galata quarter that very same year. The occupation, this occupation called Konfektion in German was an innovative sort of business. Ready to wear clothes were more fashionable, more luxurious and more expensive than locally tailored goods. His colleague or competitor Meyer is credited with a certain adaptation to local tastes, also colors and cutting, but it's probably also true for the other Austrians who entered this particular branch in Ottoman Turkey. In fact, Istanbul somewhat later even had an Ashkenazi tailor's synagogue, Schneider Temple. It was an interesting application point for sewing machines, which had diffused earlier in mid middle European countries, uh, as we were, as I've said. Hermann Bach, was his later companion, was born in 1848 in Galgos, not far from Bratislava. His brother Joseph was equally born there, and it's not unthinkable that he had earlier conduct conducted a clothing business in Vienna. First registration act there, according to Lehmann's address book, 
dates from 1859. And in fact, that registration continued annually till 1938. The Osnibach families were not the only Central European families to enter this business and to develop into, develop to, into later de uh, department stores. See Stein, Meyer, Thiering, Strauss, but there were also others and non-Jews as well. This was the era after the Crimean War, which generated many changes in the Ottoman Empire and more intensive trade with Europe due to improved maritime and railway connections. What struck me was a reference by the Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm in his book, Age of Empire, to his maternal uncle, whose family name he did not spell out in the text. It says, Uncle Albert had built up a chain of stores in the Levant, Constantinople, Smyrna, Aleppo, Alexandria. In the early 20th century, there was plenty of business to be done in the Ottoman Empire and in the Middle East. And Austria had long been Central European Europe's business window on the Orient, unquote. As I found out, his uncle was Albert Meyer, who owned a chain of department stores in the Middle East, one of them in Alexandria, the place of Hobsbawm's birth. We usually refer to this as the first modern globalization of trade and finance, which took place between roughly 1870 and 1914. Uh, you are aware of the commercial yearbooks such as the Annuaire Oriental, mentioned also in the previous lecture by Ben Singer, a genre which had parallels in many other almanacs, which served the local upper layers, ports of, of uh, the population, ports, and foreign residents of the larger cities, a population which had considerably augmented. The effect uh, could, soon be soon, could soon be seen in several of the main streets and new shopping areas in Istanbul, Cairo, Alexandria, Izmir, Salonika, and the like. One of the best proofs is the Grand Rue de Pera, Istikal Jalousie of today, which was lined up with luxury stores and several department stores which sold European merchandise. My colleague Javus Cresse in Vienna has in his book on the subject a detailed map of all the luxury stores in the Grande Rue de Pera, which proves that consumerism embraced a wide spectrum of trade in imported goods. So far, most of these luxury stores have attracted less scholarly attention. Our narrative rather focuses on department stores, which gradually developed as an imitation idea, not really wholesale projects such as factories or other installations, which were invited and transferred as turnkey um, objects some, uh, or uh, uh, events, sometimes with technicians. The ascendancy, is, the ascendancy of this type of business needs a few elucidations. They emerged in France in the first half of the 19th century. For instance, Au Beau Marché from 1838, Gimbals in America from 1842, New York. And this commercial trend was soon imitated in the largest cities of Europe and North America. Though the scholarly literature often shows national biases, France, United States, later also England and Germany, all claiming the idea, the layout of the Grand Magasin is generally endorsed as an invention of the French bourgeoisie. Maybe also Emile Zola's book, Au Bonheur des Dames, the Dames had contributed to that. In 1994, the American sociologist Michael Miller published a pioneering book on Au Bon Marché and its significance, thanks to their preservation of a very large archive. The rush of, interesting, of interested historians, which ensued, became so uh, popular that the firm had to end free access. In fact, the advent of department stores in the Middle East too has now also drawn academic re uh, interest in recent years. As elsewhere, Middle Eastern department stores are diversified, but most, not all, were set up by outsiders. 
impression sometimes maybe more in Cairo than in Istanbul that they were a Jewish invention, which is not true. In Cairo, you also had uh, Sidnawi, who were Syrians, and Davis Bryans, who were Welshmen. Likewise, in Istanbul, besides Orosti Bak and the other Austrians, uh, you also had Baker, Bortoli, Roussier, Bonval, de Melchian, et so, etc., and quite a few others. Moreover, one of the greatest tours in uh, Cairo, Chicorel catered to the upper classes, while Orosti Bak apparently attracted customers from the still upper middle classes. However, in Baghdad, they, uh, they, also, they were definitely the top store. Yawus Kase has called them vertical bazaars. The department stores were mostly multi-story businesses, which displayed a variety of merchandise in vitrine, between an etalage, allowed free access, employed a host of unobtrusive salespersons, male and later also female. The business was based on a large turnover and on fixed prices. Fixed prices were a novelty, different from the usual haggling, although we should balance this with all sorts of reductions, special seasonal sales, lotteries, so-called tombolas and the like. In the latter part of the 19th century, some became marked by ostentatious architecture, crowned with impressive domes, large display windows, imposing staircases, large clocks, electrical lighting, and elevators, all in imitation of Europe, maybe American was less known. Typically, in such establishments of the Middle East, many languages were spoken by clients and necessarily then also by the personnel. Also stationary was multilingual, as we uh, can see from, a, from an example from Izmir. You see an invoice in French, Greek, Ladino, Armenian, and Ottoman. But French was the lingua franca. I often think in, think in terms of a commercial mission civilisatrice. The owner sometimes spoke of, a, of special merchandise, the creation of a new clientele, which is indeed growing, uh, as a business target. It reflected some French arrogance, no doubt, related to the Article de Paris, universally exported. Le fini du goût français. Ils éduquent le pays, excitent l'intérêt artistique, et veillent les qualités d'appréciation. For instance, with modern shoes being more generally adopted, a member of the Buck family could even imagine that the store was to, quote, educate Egyptians to wear socks, unquote. In connection with our Mediterranean or Middle Eastern narrative, it's interesting to observe the interchanging, somewhat confusing terminology involved. In 1907, the French paper would still write Le Bazar est d'importation orientale. On l'a grandement perfectionné à Paris. Indeed, the, the Bazar de l'Hôtel de Ville, founded in, founded in 1852, today BHV, is still today an upscale, upscale department store. The word Bazar is of Persian origin, but from an originally but it, but it meant an originally somewhat disorderly shop, and it now came to signify in Grand Magasin. The word magasin itself had entered the French la language via the Italian, ultimately deriving from the Arabic Mahzal or Mahazi. On the other hand, the generic term Bon Marché, spelled in Turkish, differently from French, later came to signify a European type department store. For Rostibach, the meaning of Paris as the cultural capital of the world was crucial. By 1870, at least one of the Orosdis had made it to Paris. A more a, importantly, the headquarters or siege social of the now Etablissement Orosdibach 
became in 1895 a shareholders company with a capital of 10,000 uh, million francs, which was quite a lot of money. 70% remained in the hands of the family, the rest in the hands of the Ottoman bank and of public subscribers. It also had its own logo, a, a elephant on a tree cycle, as you see. Already in 1898, Oros Dibat reported to shareholders vos comptoirs du Levant sont les plus importants de ces contrées où ils tiennent à la tête du commerce. If you want to believe it, in 1908, the company boasted that its import into Turkey had reached an unparalleled 5% of the total imports of the Ottoman Empire. And as far as French investments were concerned, Oros in 1940 is calculated to have taken the third place. That's all if you want to believe it, because we don't have definite uh, figures. I must, however, add that in spite of great efforts, I've not been able to find the archives. I've seen annual statements to shareholders, but that's all. And some con uh, extracts are today, abstracts are today on the internet. Leon Rosdi engaged in a variety of capital investments, not only department stores. And his business was not always free of legal entanglements. For instance, owing to the counterfeiting of brands, of others. Besides, he was a prominent art collector and consul general of the Dominican Republic. And his sumptuous Hotel Dorosdi today serves as the residence of the Argentinian ambassador in France. Orozdi is even mentioned in Proust's work. Hermann and Leopold Bach now started to call themselves Bach de Surani, the place in Hungary. The first de Surani acquired the more prestigious title of Consul General of Persia, which may, may explain the later establishment of branches of the company in Tabriz and uh, Tehran. But these did not last uh, many were, um, maybe it was logistically too far uh, for supplies and they were closed in 1925. Here you have also the names, difficult to read, but there was uh, also intermarriage with the titles uh, like uh, Baron Dos, Dorosti, Surani, uh, Trey de Partillon, uh, Forêt, Divon, is there du bonnet of the drink and the uh, shampoo. Both families converted to Catholicism and married their daughters off into high society. Philip Buck, after having managed the branches in Egypt, supported not only the building of the grand new grand synagogue in Cairo, but also important archaeological excavations there and later returned to Hungary, where he played a role in politics and even became a baron. Um, let us look at the trade company itself. Its statutes of 1895 spoke of purchase and sale, importation and exportation, of all commodity, commodities and products, manufacturing, depositories, commissions, real estate and transportation, what have you. The following map, shows its expansion over its long existence. True, not all branches existed at the same time. Some fell and some emerged, but the nature of the company's commerce rested on the same principle. The division between purchasing offices, agences d'achat in Europe and trade posts, comptoirs in the East. Basically one directional, which with uh, maybe one exception, the other way around, namely the export of Turkish rugs. I have marked here all the places, the European places in red, the uh, Eastern places in green, and you see that it's quite an empire around the Mediterranean. Orosli Bak would consistently advertise the locations of the purchasing agencies, such as Vienna, Manchester, Bradford, Birmingham, Lyon, of course, and all the places you see here. The map is, shows, in fact, the great uh, industrial cities in Europe, 
uh, each of which could be identified with a certain manufacturer. And uh, the outlets are, of course, uh, smaller and larger places in uh, the Middle East and the Levant included. Most of the places in the region were so-called port cities and railway nodes. Some of the outlets were probably no more than warehouses of stocks or maybe wholesale points. It's my contention that the Rostibak as an intermediary supplied a host of indigenous merchants in the hinterland. But from the last two decades of the 19th century, we see a clear transition from a, a wholesale to retailing, from en gros to en détail, and there was even another category called the micro. Um, and this implied also the construction of new department stores. Here you see two advertisements from yearbooks, one which has um, en gros, the other one has en gros et en détail, with some of the articles. This is quite standard for their advertising and the uh, places from where uh, they imported and where they export, where, where they export. As far as our material goes, we have images of many of such buildings, Istanbul, Cairo, Port Said, Beirut, Adana, and somewhat later in Baghdad and in Tunisia. Uh, there were also larger establishments in Saloniki and Izmir, but they were lost by hostilities and fires. So far, visual documentation is lacking on a number of places. Never did I find something on Samsung, Aleppo, Deir Azul, or Basra. But with the digitation of more and more sources, they might surface one day. As for Istanbul, um, their first tour had been in Galata, but it had been succeeded by a new establishment uh, at the Omar Efendi Khan at, in the Bahçe Kapı area of old Istanbul, Istanbul in Western parlance. The Khan is in theory and in the combined trade point and host, and I don't know what preceded the, the place of this particular uh, building. If we don't know for sure, but we suppose that it was a conscious uh, decision to remain close to the traditional bazaar areas whose merchants could supply themselves at the Rostibak rather than moving up to the more exclusive Grand Rue de Pera. Remaining closer to the Eminonu railway station and the K areas was maybe an additional advantage. On the other hand, it seems from our sources that some smaller merchants and shopkeepers there had mixed feelings about it. But in Cairo too, Rosli Bak remained a bit aloof and did not go to the opulent Fuad al Awal or Imad al Din streets area, thus remaining closer to the first shop they had in the Muski area, also called Rue de France. Nearly uh, nearby Ataba Square was moreover well provided in terms of public transport. But then again, contemporary large department stores like Tiering and Sednawi were also a bit offside in Cairo and their buildings can still be seen today. Here I show a colored poster found in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, which was clearly, which was clearly meant to emphasize modernity. Delivery cars, which we see here, and uh, as Obu Moshe had, I think it's an, an imitation here, uh, an airplane. Uh, Leon Rosny's son was an aviator, and the main caption is in French, but uh, the other um, writings here are in Ottoman Turkish and specify all the different articles that he had for sale. In the library of the University of Istanbul has a, or possesses a unique series of photographs of the interior, quite some tens of pictures dating from approximately 1907. 
Interior photography at the time was rare. A spacious multi-store building, which still exists, was constructed around that year. And in 1911, even enlarged, when retailing had clearly become more significant. The collection, as you, if you look at it, um, very gives a good impression of what was still basically a vast wholesale establishment with lots of merchandise uh, on the stacks, and yet no women around, neither uh, as salespersons nor as customers. Meanwhile, from the 1880s, a uh, similar somewhat uh, smaller store had operated in Izmir. Trade in Saloniki must have started around the same time. There, a branch was opened in 1901, uh, uh, lost in 1917 with the big fire, followed by Adana and Samsung, much smaller, but regional, uh, by uh, vital regional centers. Here you have Plovdiv in Bulgaria, which was quite early closed, uh, owing to financial difficulties. Here you have Port Said. You have a picture of um, Adana. Somebody has uh, published not long ago a book on Adana, uh, largely relying on my work. The small, small, the small uh, Cairo store of 1856 in the Muski area continued to do, do business, but was since 1908 overshadowed by an icon iconic Parisian style modern building on the corner of Abel Aziz and Rochdi Street, bearing the likeness of the famous Au Printemps store in Paris. I would call it their flagship store. Initially, two of the six floors had been reserved for wholesale business. It spotlights in the cupola was, um, a, was often depicted as a, as a lighthouse, emanating beams to the surroundings. Um, in the preceding decades, Austin Bach, Bach branches had also been opened in Alexandria and in Port Said. The latter, which served maritime travelers, we've just seen it through the Suez Canal, like the famous Simon Arts Emporium, but it only, that one only did in uh, uh, did retailing. The smaller branches in Tanta and Zakazik in the Delta did not last beyond the 1920s. Uh, well, here we have Ostibak in, in uh, Port Said. You see there is a steamer right on the cape. Um, in booming Beirut, an equally impressive building had been constructed near the harbor, which was officially opened in 1900 on the Sultan, on Sultan Abdul Hamid's 25th anniversary to the throne. As a novelty in town, maybe in the entire Levant, it had three stores with elevators. It burned down in 1937, allegedly by arson, after which the enterprise moved closer to Ariada Sul Square in town. As to Syria, we know very little about the about um, regularly mentioned business in Aleppo from 1906 and about a more outlying Derazur. But from the 1880s, free trade had been expanded into Tunisia. Tunis itself, Rostibak moved into a large building, the Rue Sadikia in Tunis near what is, I think, the main artery, uh, even Avenue Bourquiba of today. Of the branches in Bizert and Sfax, first was, however, completely destroyed in the Allied bombardment of 1942. Fifth main store was added on the newly laid out Rashid Street in Baghdad in the, 90, in the late 1930s, uh, after preceding business in that city. It became finally uh, Ostibak's most luxurious department store, still remembered by erstwhile elites as Baghdad's Herods of the East. Exclusive brands like Bali Shoes and others. One personal anecdote here, the then editor-in-chief of Middle Eastern Studies, which I published my article, 
the late Sylvia Haim Kaduri, Haim Kaduri, immediately endorsed my craft article on the Rosti Bach because she fondly remembered her first maiden shoes from there. In addition to Baghdad, Rosti Bach also had the branch in Basra, about which so far we know less. What was the success of their trade? It's evident that they had moved on from ready to wear clothing and drapery to a wide array of consumer durables. These articles in Paris were of course not uh, only French, also many Austrian, German and British and other goods. Novelties, novelty was a much better term. Their customers desired to be like the most advanced upper echelons of Europe, ruling classes, foreign residents, several religious and ethnic minorities with European outlooks or connections. It implied the expectation of pop perpetually getting or needing something new in line with the latest Parisian fashions and taste, which could now be purchased locally as if in Paris. This was also the era in which shopping became fashionable, including for women, though often at that time still in small groups, not that much as a family. Once the physical parts of the souk, bazaar, charchet, had been a predominantly male affair, but now women in Istanbul and Cairo and in other major cities began to patronize the department stores. Bourgeois women shopping became a more common phenomenon, sometimes even criticized or lampooned. These are aspects which still need more profound research. One must not forget that the feminization of shopping is related to the independent use of money or credit. From advertisements, as well as from memoirs, we know that the range of merchandise gradually, gradually became quite wide. From clothes and silk and cotton goods, clothing, hats, hosiery, which included not only socks and stockings, but also knitted underwears, not underwear, vests, waistcoats, cardigans, shawls, and baby clothes. Furthermore, blankets and all sorts of accessories, such as um, canes and shoes, two furniture, uh, bentwood tonnette chairs from Czechia, ceramics, decoration, household goods, which reflected important changes in the domestic sphere. Take, for instance, iron bedsteads, which were new. Indeed, at the time, new books appeared in Arabic and in Turkish to teach would-be higher class women how to run a respectable household, the Bir al manzal Also, China ware and crystal, silver cutlery, such as the famous Christophe brand, ironware in general, such as trades, uh, trays and so on, and increasingly travel goods and children's toys, which were a new article. It's difficult to ascertain how much trade was conducted in bicycles, an object which was sold also by other department stores. But it's, uh, interestingly, the Rostebach logo was an elephant on a tricycle, which we have seen sometimes added with, or to, to which uh, sometimes the words were added, the ultimate luxury. Um, there are a few items which observe special mention. In first place, fezes or tabushes, an important item of the outfit of civil servants, military, members of the free occupations and students. In the economic world, uh, that item was not exclusively, but mo uh, the, in, the, in the economic world or of that time, I must say, that item was not exclusively, but mostly manufactured in Bohemia. In 1899, Oros announced that they had succeeded to form a syndicate of five producers in Strakonitz, South Bohemia, to ward off competition from France, Italy, Germany, and Belgium, adding somewhat exaggerately that they had acquired the exclusive right of representation in the entire world. True, the new syndicate remained for long the largest fez producer in the world. French Chamber of Commerce in Istanbul saw French industry passed over in general criticism against high prices of the commodity could be heard. 
a typical, another typical French luxury item were perfumes. Leon Rosdi had entered this branch in France, selling his Ramses brand, a Ambre de Nubie, as you can see here, a fragrance um, which, as if, came from Egypt, but it came from France. Then there was imitation jewelry, a new trend in part imported from Gablons in Czechia, Bohemia. It was undoubtedly a fashionable novelty, which ran counter to the long established tradition of an adorning real gold, of adorning real gold. In the 1920s, Rostibak even entered the Burma firm, which still exists today. Then there were gramophones and records. So another innovative item and very popular. We know about a lawsuit, uh, about a lawsuit between the well-known Egyptian singer Fer Yusuf al Manjalawi, which you uh, can see here, and uh, Rosti Bak with regard to exclusive recordings uh, for them in 1907. This is highly intriguing, intriguing because such recordings, recordings cater to a local taste. In any case, we assume with some caution, not primarily to the taste of most foreign residents. In Istanbul, Orosti Bak also sold Western musical instruments, as you can see from the series which I mentioned before. Uh, the company also established a watch factory of its own in La Chaux de Fonds in the, the Jura in 1898 and produced some year, for some years pocket watches under the abbreviated brand name, name Orba. It would seem that the Rosti Bak had, own, had not only uh, the Ottoman mar uh, market in mind, but also Japan. But Japan raised its import duties in 1903. The adventure ultimately failed. We do not know to what extent these watches were marketed in the Middle East. In Istanbul, I've always looked for them <coughs> in vain, and I will keep looking for them. But they are sometimes offered for sale by antiquarians in Japan. Clocks were equally in great, in were, were not equally were, were in great demand, as you can see here. Till today, I have not found any almost debug trade brochures or catalogs, although I have one or two indications that they may have existed. An advertisement of 1934 of Egypt says, ask for our catalog. And some people seem to remember them. The main department stores in French had them, even with elaborate um, samples of cloth and textiles. And it is well known that the Parisian department stores, such as Au bon Marché, sent thousands of their own catalogs abroad, inviting orders by mail. Au printemps of Paris regularly advertised in foreign language bulletins in Istanbul. And in general, their uh, illustrated catalogs could be ordered free of charge, uh, for instance, propagated by Beirut magazines. Uh, only a GA Baker store catalog in Pera um, has so far been found. As a researcher of consumption history, I often deplore that this sort of publicity and material is thrown away after looking through it and generally considered to be unworthy for libraries and archives, except for instance, Victoria and Albert and some other institutions. For, unfortunately, trade catalogs are not the sort of item which one keeps and even if librarians tend to ignore them. For our narrative, it means that we cannot follow shifts in supply, demand, in fashion, and in taste. With advertising in periodicals gradually developing, print communities uh, came to overlap with literate consumer communities. Rosdibak frequently advertised in many full newspapers, usually in rather unimaginative style, and it seems less than other department stores like Thieringstein, Chicorel, or Sidnawi. Maybe Orosti Bak trusted its fixed uh, clientele. 
needless to say, all claim to have a, the largest assortment and the best prices. From the fact that no address was stated, it's clear that the location of the stores was assumed to be well known. Advertising in the Ottoman press in Turkey or in the Arabic press in, in, in Egypt uh, was an important social marker of their shifting clientele. But uh, we see more Arabic advertising over time, but we will be able to say more in future when the digitization process is complete. Here are a few curious examples from the 1940s in Arabic. A children's toys, quite a curious advertisement, I think, Omar Effendi in Cairo. Here is a uh, royal program to um, encourage Falahin, Falas, to wear uh, shoes. Probably Rosti Buck had also to earn something from it. But in any case, they advertised with the royal crown and with their own building in. Uh, Cairo. And here's also a cinema ticket, which was maybe not a ticket, it was a, a, a sort of a leaflet to propagate a cinema, but it has in French, in, in Arabic, the name and the name of the, uh, the movie. Here it is in English and all the articles that they uh, used to sell. Business was not always lucrative. A, the region was risky, particularly not during the first half of the 20th century. A, in the annual reports with shareholders one encounters not only successes, but also many adversities, owing to hostilities, natural disasters, epidemics, fires and arson, boycotts, economic depressions and population exchanges. Sometimes valuable information on the customers can be derived. For instance, bad harvests, marasme, as they called it, the affected sales in general. So one sees how clients depend on agricultural conditions. Another example is the boycott of Austrian goods in 1908, a reaction to the annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which dealt a heavy blow to the import of fezes. And in, on the longer, longer run, to the import of Austrian Hungarian ready made clothing in general. This is a chapter in itself, which I will not go into now. But even when the company could not pay a yearly dividend, the company remained resilient and imagined themselves as a sort of pyramid. This explains also that at a rather uh, large, uh, late stage, they sought new outlets in Morocco and in France. However, new political developments, in short, nationalism, economic atheism, and protectionism became the, the final blow. Capitulations were abolished in Turkey in 1914, in Egypt in the transition period from 1937 to 49, and Egypt protect, enacted prohibitive import laws in 1930, Turkey in 1931, maybe indigenous and meanwhile, new indigenous department stores made their appearance in both countries. There was a whole series of them. In uh, Turkey, most of the branches of Ostibak were closed. The main branch was taken over by Simmer Bank, not a surprising buyer because it was expressly founded by Atatürk to boost local industries. Similarly, in, in the 1930s, uh, now I'll skip that because I see that I'm, I'm getting over my time. Um, in fact, uh, the uh, in e Egypt branches were taken over in 1958, in Tunis in 1955, a little bit earlier, or in Iraq in 1961. But why did etatists and officer regimes nationalize them instead of abolishing them as an unwelcome imperialist remnant. One answer is that they decided to use them as outlets for their local industries. Egypt added even tens of new Omar Effendi branches. Seems that also in Iraq, there was some continuation or expansion 
in quantity rather than in quality, obviously these enterprises inevitably could not offer more anymore the imported luxury goods on which their previous in, uh, reputation was based. Omar Fendi nowadays has over 80 branches and are still a leading brand. Since the Infitah, Sadat's open door policy and Mubarak's neoliberal policy, the enterprise went through a difficult series of vicissitudes and including controversial sale to the Saudi Arabian company, uh, Anwal, and accusations of government corruption, reason why the deal was reverted. But the half the empty, or the half empty iconic flagship store still stands here. You have the author, uh, the speaker of tonight in 2010 in the building, and it still looks quite impressive. It's conspicuous, conspicuous um, that uh, nowadays uh, the Ostibak. Uh, or the Omar Effendi branches pride themselves on having been established in 1856, which was unthinkable, I think, in the um, officer uh, regime period. And sometimes uh, advertising does not even hide its Jewish origin and even or advertising in newspaper articles and even highlights the luxurious products. Few Egyptians, however, realized that the name Omar, Omar Effendi derives not from somebody in Egypt, but from a Han in Istanbul. In France, in, it was not yet the end. Ostibak stayed for some time involved in the Bouchara, Bouchara clothing stores and Burma jewelry stores and remained registered on the Paris Stock Exchange as a real estate holding company. Only in 2014, it was delisted and shares were taken over, or may we say swallowed up by a French holding company named Syriac. And yet, Rostibak lives on in other ways. First of all, the internet sources. And maybe also my book led to inquiries by descendants of the founding families. Let me see. Um, of the founding families, in particular the Buck family, members of which wrote to me to get information on their roots. In a couple of cases, I even had to confirm to them that they really had been Jewish in origin. The interest also applies to also to former personnel. Uh, remember that they had, had large staffs, particularly Jews who dispersed all over the world. They sent me photos of festive events and personal outings, and find which I find a, impossible to identify. They always ask, can you please tell me? No, I can't. Among younger scholars, there is a lot of interest in consumption history, which embraces department stores, gendering, gender shopping, as well as urban planning and architecture. In late years, as far as I can observe, Turkey has an established pattern of publishing MA and PhD thesis on the internet, by which Orosti Bak regains its uh, historical place. This academic trend supposedly also exists in Egypt, but it's not yet as visible. Thirdly, all sorts of Orosti Bak memorabilia have surfaced, from the singer uh, sewing machines, which I mentioned, uh, and a brand of pocket watches, to dinner coins for the personnel, for the personnel. You have one sample on your uh, own website. Uh, here you see also the dining hall of the uh, store in Istanbul. You have also um, hair clips and uh, decorative uh, trays um, which were sold. Here are publicity um, objects, a uh, calendar, ashtray, and a fan, which was acquired not long ago by the Fan Museum in uh, London. Uh, postcards, which they published themselves, one here from Tunis and one from uh, uh, Izmir. 
um, in addition to uh, many other things such as invoices, envelopes, packing papers, and what have you, and I hope indeed for more. Fourthly, famous department stores anywhere are city, land, uh, are city landmarks or even tourist attractions, be it Galerie Lafayette, Selfridges or May Macy's. For older generations, there is such a thing as a mental map, Baghdad or Beirut. Here, uh, you have a drawing by somebody who was asked how Beirut looked before the uh, Civil War of 1975. And he marked also from his memory, the place of the Ostibak uh, store. Then there is a charming, very charming book by a woman, a artist called Zena Abu Rashid, whose grandfather was the inventor of one of the types of a quarter tone piano, a topic which interests me very much. And here, this book begins by her grandfather uh, going to uh, Orostibak, uh, the Orostibak store in Beirut. Fifthly, fifthly, this brings me to various memoirs, novels, and belletry, and weblogs in which Orostibak vickers today. As department stores anywhere were symbols of luxury, fantasy, and sometimes eccentricity, it's not surprising that they refer to erstwhile special attractions such as elevators, well-lit display windows, ice cream, and the like. This applies, of course, mainly to the older generation, but I'm still collecting more material on that subject. Many are Jewish recollections from Beirut, Cairo, and Baghdad, written in French or English, but I have recently discovered remembrances by Egyptians and particularly by non-minority Iraqis in Arabic as well. I have still to sort this out, in particular the differences between the difference between the various places and populations. Sixth, last but not least, maybe that's the best compliment for Osti Buck's reputation, is what I would call nostalgic plagiarism. In Baghdad, there is a rather new online store which supplies Western consumption goods, Western consumption goods under that name, explicitly harking back on its website to earlier reputation of, uh, earlier reputation of Vorostiba. In Kirkuk, uh, I found a, uh, a supermarket uh, by that name, although Vorostiba was never active there. Um, this is a store probably in Baghdad, but I'm not sure. And then there is a bridal um, uh, store, bridal, bridal uh, shopping or a fashion store in Michigan. Michigan has a lot of Iraqi uh, migrants uh, living there. Uh, they spell Rosti Beck, which is not important, but uh, they seem to be descendants of Chaldeans or Nestorians, formerly from Baghdad. And then last but not least, there was a surprise. I found a, a Swedish publisher called Orosti Buck, exactly spelled like it did, uh, with the logo, the, the vignette of uh, the original Orosti Buck, and I have really done a lot of work to find out what the idea was behind adopting that name. Whether it was done legally or not legally, uh, I'm not sure. All my uh, uh, um, inquiries also uh, to the Swedish uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, have not yielded any result. But meanwhile, the uh, publisher has been taken over by another big publisher called Bonnier. These final points, very final point, lead me to the conclusion that several day, decades ago, I started my search on the Rosti Buck in archives and libraries, but that the internet might still supplement 
much more uh, information uh, to supplement, supplement this Orosti's bug saga, as I once called it. That's it. A little bit long, but a, uh, I apologize. But that's what I wanted to say. Yuri, thank you so much. Really fascinating. Uh, history of uh, the Orosti Bach uh, story in the wider context of uh, luxury consumerism in um, the early Levant. Um, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, go to the bottom middle of the your screen and stop share. Yeah, stop share. That's it. Okay, right. Good. So um, uh, let me just put everyone on gallery, and uh, I'd like to invite um, questions and comments. I see a hand raised by, oh no, do I see a hand raised? Um, so uh, while I wait for people to sort of come in, I, I just want to ask a little bit about um, archives it seems very diverse but did were there any archives um held by the um the uh the offend omar effendi branch or, or well takeover uh company um given that cairo was the flagship store well yes i i believe there were and i still believe there are archives but as you might know, Egyptians are not very forthcoming with uh, uh, giving permission to see the, the, the archives. In fact, I did also other work in Egypt. I wrote something on the sugar industry, and I'm sure that there was a material. The personnel confirmed that to me. But then when I came to the, uh, the general manager, he said there wasn't anything. But maybe one day we will see more uh, openings and interesting material. I, I'm sure that there are, and I'm still suspecting that there must be something in Paris. Yeah, and and I imagine would any of the family descendants from the back family perhaps have anything, or is there any one of them who is a lead uh, supporter of your research? No, no, I mean, on the contrary, I, I never did any research paid by anybody. But uh, the, the interesting thing is that sometimes I get a mail uh, or even a phone call uh, from people, uh, from, from relatives, descendants, who want to know from me what I know about the Buck family in particular, um, less about the Augusti family, but there is still, there's still a, a, a branch in Hungary. Uh, I've contacted them, but it didn't work out to see them when I was in Budapest. Um, maybe I will one day. They um, seem to be a little bit less interested. Um, but the Buck family definitely, with all their you know, French uh, high society names, are definitely interested and try to get information from me rather than I uh, succeed getting from them. Yes. Well, perhaps so. Uh, yeah, we can help with that and sort of put out a a, a notice to anybody who knows a back or an Orosti uh, descendant. Please to get in touch if they have pictures or any archives uh, that they're willing to to share, because um, it seems as though there must be material out there. It's just a question of winkling it out. Yeah, I expect a lot also from digitizing of newspapers and magazines and all the years yearbooks. I mentioned uh, the Anuaire Oriental, but there are quite a few of them for the different cities. And for instance, it's, it's difficult for me to imagine that there is nothing which I found on Aleppo or on Basra. There must be material. And with more digitizing, things will surface. Yeah. Um, now, has anyone got a question or comment? Um, I'm not sure I understand. If anyone's got anything. Um, otherwise, I, I've got one or two other points to raise. No? Um, so one thing I was curious about is why did they um, convert 
from Judaism to Catholicism? What was the motivation there? I think it's something like mobility, social mobility. As you know, France was not a very uh, forthcoming country for people with uh, Jewish roots, although well, some people did make careers. So in order to get into the real uh, high society of France, uh, of Paris, uh, you had to convert. And they didn't make a big thing of it. It's, uh, uh, I think it was a sort of formal act. And it happened not only in France, it happened to so many families elsewhere as well. And, and, and I'm curious on whether it's that same motivation is linked to uh, acquiring the consul generalships, if that's the right word, for places like uh, the Dominican Republic and Costa Rica. Was it they, they were the first ones that they could acquire and add as titles to their names? Well, it's, it's like what you can get, could get. There were countries looking for uh, for consuls, for representatives. And by the way, there were countries that had also foreign ministries, uh, ministers who uh, were not of uh, citizens or uh, locals uh, from their point of view. So um, it's not it's not at all rare. Or, uh, you you could have it if you were, were well qualified, uh, you had money, because in order to be a diplomat at the time or a consul, you had to have money to uh, host people, to give receptions, uh, to give away something. And uh, I don't think it was something very special. Uh, of course, Iran was, or Persia was, that, that, that was struck me as something exceptional, because mostly, uh, people would like to get a representation of a very small country uh, where there was very little work to do, few passports to be given out or something. But it's not at all uh, rare. Yeah. And, and I know we've seen, well, some Levantines used to acquire several of them. So Yes, definitely. So. Well, that's mainly the, there were families which specialized in, in getting consulates and uh, uh, all of the Middle East, whether well, families like Bicciotto or I don't know, what, you, who, who really were all around in there were three, four, five generations. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and then a last thing for me, it's a commercial question. To, to what it, did they ever try in the ready to wear business establish a factory in the Middle East or was all the ready to wear? Um, product made in you know, Europe? Not that I know, but they had workshops and you could, uh, I, I don't know whether all this clothing came uh, already ready from where, wherever it was, from Vienna or from other places. And later, of course, the, the, the female clothing, uh, fashionable clothing from Paris. Um, but there were definitely people working on the premises as tailors to mend certain items that were bought. And so I, I knew somebody here uh, whose mother worked like that in such a capacity in Alexandria for Hano, which was another department store. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, that's, that's it for me. I mean, the last question is, is there anything that you're looking for that we might be able to help with through the Levantine Heritage Foundation in terms of getting the message out to people, you know, things that you're looking for that might contribute to your um, book that, that you're, you're working on, or, or anything more about the Oroz de Bacca saga? Well, I do reprint uh, the, um, the main article on Oroz de Bacca in Egypt, but I have moved on to all kinds of other things uh, I've uh, and I'm not the only one. Uh, I've written on typewriters, for instance, which was uh, uh, not covered as a topic, and uh, pianos, particularly quarter-tone pianos, uh, to make uh, Oriental or Eastern music. Uh, but uh, there are so many things still to do, and um, I'm already for ten years in emeritus, and I think I 
have plans for another 30 years ahead. Well, now, about little things, now anything that can be found, let's say, I mentioned catalogs. This is a very uh, important topic. If anybody finds a catalog, it would be wonderful to put it on the internet. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we'd be delighted to help with that. And perhaps one of the things that we could do is follow up with you with a, a, a written interview that we, we publish where we can pick up some of these topics uh, for our audience to read and maybe uh, contribute. Okay, at your service. Um, well, uh, Yuri, thank you so much. A really fascinating uh, story um, and uh, clearly lots more to do. Um, and I, I hope you great, wish you great success with that. Um, and if we can help in any way, we'd be very glad to. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure to be with you. And I hope to, be, to remain in contact. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, everybody, for joining uh, today, this evening, or this morning, wherever you are. Um, and I look forward to seeing you uh, on another occasion. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.